Hello, welcome to lecture 15 of Electrical Circuits 1. First few minutes of this lecture, I'm going to go back and review what we did last time. You recall last time we started talking about energy storage and dynamic systems. So I want to refresh our memory about that because it's so important. We also talked a little bit about basic time varying signals. Since we'll be taking advantage of those soon, I wanted to refresh our memory about them as well. The bulk of this lecture, I'm going to talk about one of our electrical circuit energy storage elements, capacitors. Okay, and the material relative to capacitors in the educational modules are section 2.2. Now a quick refresher on dynamic systems. We're going to start analyzing circuits which contain energy storage elements. We'll be storing electrical energy in some of our circuit elements. These circuits are dynamic systems. As I mentioned last time, dynamic systems are typically governed by differential equations. We're going to have derivatives or rates of change with time in the governing equations that relate the input of the system to the output of the system. So in order to relate the input and the output, we have to be concerned with both of those as functions of time. Okay, so the system output not only depends on the input at the current time, it also depends upon the input at previous times, and more specifically, the state of the system at some previous time before the current input of interest gets applied to the system. Okay, in the last lecture, we also introduced two basic time varying signals that we'll be using throughout the rest of the course. The first of these was the unit step function u0 of t. That function is defined as being 0 for times t less than 0 and 1 for times t greater than or equal to 0. Now occasionally you will see the definition of u0 of t be slightly different than this at time t equals 0. We won't let that bother us for anything that we do in this course. The definition of u0 of t at the time t equals 0 will not matter to us. Graphically, it looks like this. We have 0 before t equals 0. We have 1 after t equals 0. Our other main function of interest at the moment is going to be an exponential function. Now, we define that function as some constant times e to the minus t over tau. And we restricted our attention to times greater than 0. Tau is extremely important. It is called the time constant. If we graph this, Okay, at time t equals 0, the f of t is a. What happens at one time constant after t equals 0 is that our value of our function has decreased to 36.8% of a. And in fact, for any tau interval of seconds, we will decrease by 63.2%. Our next major step is going to be to analyze electrical circuits which contain energy storage elements. In order to get to that step, we want to introduce what our main energy storage elements are for electrical circuits. The first of these is going to be capacitors. Now, capacitors store energy in an electric field. Okay? The way we do that is typically to take two conductive elements. In this particular example, I have conductive parallel plates, top and bottom, and separate them by some non-conductive or dielectric material. So the blue material in between here does not conduct electricity. If we apply a voltage across these, since we don't conduct electricity through the dielectric, we build up a positive charge at the positive voltage node and a negative charge at the negative voltage node. Now, these charges separated by some distance create an electric field. Okay? The strength of this electric field dictates how much energy we can store in this capacitor. Now, from a lumped parameters circuit schematic standpoint, we will represent our capacitor as this symbol here. It kind of indicates these two parallel plates, which are separated by some distance. We have some voltage difference across the capacitor and some current through the capacitor. 
Notice that these agree with my passive sign convention. This is a passive circuit element. I need to assume that current is entering the positive voltage node. The capacitance, C, has units of farads. And the capacitance essentially relates the voltage difference across this to the amount of charge that's accumulating between these plates. So Q of T is C times V of T. Now recall that current is the rate of change of charge with time. I is dQ by dT. If we take this, the derivative of this, with respect to time, I of T is the derivative with respect to time of this quantity. C, the capacitance, is typically taken to be a constant value so that it can be taken outside of the derivative. Therefore, I of t is C times the derivative of voltage with respect to time. I is C dV dt. Now, this is an extremely important result. We now have a voltage current relationship for a capacitor. Okay? I of t is C dV dt. Memorize that. Okay? It's going to become as important as Ohm's law to us. V is equal to I times R for resistors. I is C dV dT for capacitors. It is quite common to express this relationship in integral form as well. So if we integrate both sides, integral of I of T dT from some time T0 to some time T is equal to C times the integral of dV from some time t0 to some time t. I'm being a little bit careless with my notation, but it'll get us where we want to go. So if I divide both sides by c, 1 over c integral from time t0 to t of i dt is equal to v of t minus v at t0. We can write the voltage across the capacitor as the integral of the current through the capacitor. So V of T is 1 over C times the integral of the current through the capacitor plus some initial voltage at time T0. Now there are a few very important things to note about capacitors. I have two specific notes to make right at the moment. Remember those for later. First one, if voltage is constant, no current is going to flow through the capacitor. I is C dV dt. If V is a constant, the derivative of voltage with respect to time is 0. So I is equal to 0 if everything else is constant. So if nothing is changing with time, capacitors act like an open circuit. So if everything in your circuit is constant, what you can do is take your capacitors and redraw them as open circuits and analyze the circuit that way. We'll use that trick a lot. Another important thing, if I try to change voltage suddenly, okay, remember, I is C dV by dT. If I try to change voltage suddenly, dV by dT goes to infinity. To change the voltage across a capacitor immediately in zero time, you need infinite current. Okay? Infinite current and a finite voltage imply that infinite power is required in order to change the voltage suddenly. That means that in any physical circuit, you cannot change the voltage across a capacitor suddenly. Okay? Capacitor voltages must be continuous functions of time. We'll use that fact a lot when we're switching voltages to capacitors suddenly. Now let's take a look at the actual energy storage mathematically occurring within capacitors. Power, by definition, is voltage times current. We already said that current is C dV dt. Therefore, we have voltage times C dV dt. This is the expression for the power dissipated or absorbed by the capacitor. If we want to find energy, Energy is the time integral of power. So we take this expression, 
integrate it with respect to time, I'm going to start my integration at time negative infinity and integrate up to time t. And then I will assume that at time t equals minus infinity, I have had no power or energy stored in the capacitor previous to that. If I do this integration, and I'm going to do it rather sloppily by pretending that I'm going to cancel out the dt's here and then integrate with respect to dv. Okay, I can take this c out because I've already claimed I'm going to refer to c as a constant value. This integrates, v dv integrates to v squared over 2. So I have v squared over 2 times c evaluated between time negative infinity and time t. I said that the energy storage is going to be 0 at time negative infinity, so this simplifies down to 1 half c v squared of t. Therefore, we look at the energy stored by a capacitor in terms of the voltage difference across the capacitor itself. Now let's take a look at a quick example of calculating energy storage and power dissipation of a capacitor. We have a voltage source, V of t, which is applied directly across this capacitor, C, which has a capacitance of 1 microfarad. I'm applying a voltage V of t according to this plot. Okay, For the first microsecond, I'm going to increase my voltage linearly between 0 and 10 volts. Over the next microsecond, I'm going to decrease the voltage linearly down to 5 volts, and then I'm going to keep the voltage across the capacitor constant at 5 volts after that. I want to determine the power absorbed by the capacitor as a function of time and plot that. And I'm going to also determine and plot the energy stored in the capacitor. Okay, The first thing we're going to do is get the power dissipated by the capacitor as a function of time and plot that. If I've got the voltage curve, I can get the current through the capacitor from the capacitor's voltage current relationship. I is C dV by dt. Since I know the capacitance, this is 1 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. I multiply that number by the rate of change of voltage with time. That will give me the current. If I multiply the voltage times the current, that will give me the desired power that I'm trying to plot. So. In this time range between 0 and 1 microsecond, dV by dt is a voltage change of 10 volts over a time change of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. This becomes 10 times 10 to the 6th volts per second. If I plug this in up here during the time range from 0 to 1 microseconds, I is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 6 farads times 10 times 10 to the 6 volts per second, which is 10 amps. During the next time period, between 1 and 2 microsecond, dV by dt is a change of negative 5 volts divided by a time change of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds, which becomes minus 5 times 10 to the 6 volts per second. If I multiply this by my capacitance, I is equal to minus 5 amps. So if I plot my current as a function of time, I of t, between 0 and 1 microsecond, I have 10 amps. Between 1 and 2 microseconds, I have minus 5 amps. After 2 microseconds, dV by dt is equal to 0. Therefore, the current is 0 amps. I have no current for times after 2 microseconds, although I still have a voltage difference across the capacitor.
Now in the next slide, I'm going to take these curves, multiply them point by point, and get the power curve. Okay. Power is the product of voltage and current. So the power at any time is the voltage at that time multiplied by the current at that time. So if I want to plot power as a function of time, I can multiply point by point the voltage times the current and plot the result. So here's time, P of t in watts. During the time from 0 to 1 microsecond, my current is constant. It's 10 amps. I'm going to multiply this curve by a constant number, which is simply a straight line. It's going to start at 0 and go to 10 volts times 10 amps, or 100 watts. So at 1 microsecond, I am at 100 watts. Then, immediately, I start having a negative power. So in this range, I have a negative 5 amp current multiplied by this curve. So I start out at negative 5 times 10, or minus 50 watts. And I end up at t equals 2 microseconds at negative 5 amps times 5 volts, which is minus 25 watts. After this point, current is 0, so power is 0. Notice that the capacitor is not always absorbing power or always generating power. During this time, power is positive, so it is actually absorbing power. between time t equals 0 and time t equals 1 microsecond. So we've stored energy during this time. During this time period, we have a negative power. The capacitor has actually turned around and started generating power. It's taking some of the power that it stored here and giving it back to that voltage source. So we have to pay particular attention to the signs on our powers for these energy storage elements because they aren't always necessarily going to be agreeing with or disagreeing with the passive sign convention. They can store energy, then they can re-release it back to the circuit. In the next slide, I'll take this curve and these curves and plot the energy stored by the capacitor as a function of time. Now let's take a look at the energy stored in the capacitor as a function of time. I'm going to use my relationship W of t is equal to 1 half C V of t squared in order to plot the energy. So this is equal to 1 half times 1 times 10 to the minus 6 farads times whatever the voltage is. So when t is equal to 1 microsecond, the voltage is 10 volts. So w is 1 half times 1 times 10 to the minus 6 times 10 squared or 100. This is 50 times 10 to the minus 6th joules. So at t equals 1 microsecond, w is 50 microjoules. Now, when t is equal to 2 microseconds, the voltage, V, is equal to 5 volts. So the energy stored is 1 half times 1 times 10 to the minus 6 times 5 squared, or 25, which is 25 over 2 times 10 to the minus 6. So W is 12.5 microjoules. So at 2 microseconds, we're down to 12.5 microjoules.
This is a straight line. If I square a linear relationship, I get a quadratic relationship. So I can connect these points by a quadratic. This is also linear. It can also be represented as a quadratic roll off. At this time, the voltage is constant at 5 volts. So after this time here, I just stay at 12.5 microjoules. So I'm building up energy in the capacitor here when, as we saw from our power curve, the capacitor is absorbing power. We reduce the energy stored by the capacitor during the period of time when the capacitor is generating power or giving power back to the voltage source. After that, the capacitor's energy is constant because it's neither absorbing nor generating power. Back when we were looking at resistive circuits, when we were doing circuit reduction, we took parallel and series combinations of resistors. Then we combined those combinations to reduce the total number of unknowns and make the circuit simpler to analyze. We're going to do the same thing with capacitors. First, we're going to take a look at series combinations of capacitors. I have n capacitors, C1, C2, on up to C sub n. I have put them all in series here and placed a voltage source, V of t, across that series combination. Now, since these are in series, they all share the same current. That current I'm going to denote as I of t. It's the same for each individual capacitor. They will not, however, have the same voltage difference across them. Capacitor C1 will have voltage V1 of t. Capacitor C2 will have voltage V2 of t, so on and so forth, up to capacitance C sub n. Now, if we do KVL around this loop, the voltage V of t is equal to the sum of the individual voltages across all the capacitors. So V of t is V1 of t plus V2 of t plus all the other voltages plus V sub n of t. Now, when we did capacitive voltage current characteristics, we wrote differential and integral forms. The voltage across a capacitor was related to the current through it by an integral. So V1 of t is 1 over C1 times the integral from t0 to t of I dt plus the voltage V1 at time t0. Likewise, V2 of t was 1 over C2 integral from time t0 to t of the current with respect to time plus V2 at t0, and so on and so forth up to the capacitor V sub n, which has voltage 1 over C sub n times the integral from t0 to t of I dt plus the voltage across capacitor n at time t0. So if I sum up all of these, notice that the integral term in each of these is the same. So if I sum up all these, what I end up doing is summing up the inverse of each of the capacitances. So I can write this as 1 over c1 plus 1 over c2 plus up to 1 over c sub n times this common term integral from t0 to t of i dt plus the sum of the individual voltages across the capacitors at t0. Now, if I invoke KVL at this specific time t0, the sum of all of these voltages is just this voltage at time t0. So we get this final voltage relationship for the series combination of capacitors. This summed up term now looks like 1 over some equivalent capacitance times the integral of the current with respect to time plus some initial total voltage across all the capacitors. Let's take a look at simplifying that on the next slide. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, this series combination of capacitances can be represented as a single equivalent capacitance. So this circuit here 
is indistinguishable from this circuit here under certain circumstances. If I take a look at the voltage relationship for this circuit, V of t is 1 over CEQ times the integral from t0 to t of I dt plus V at t0. If I compare this relationship with the final relationship on the previous slide, I can see that this term here equates to this sum of 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus all the other inverted capacitances up to 1 over C sub n. So 1 over CEQ is simply the summation from k equals 1 to n of 1 over C sub 1 plus 1 over C sub 2 plus all the other inverted capacitances. This is very similar to the relationship that we found when we looked at parallel combinations of resistors. If you want to, in the back of your mind, tuck away the idea that capacitors in series sum in the same way that resistors in parallel do, that's perfectly fine with me. Now I'm going to look at parallel combinations of capacitors. I'm going to take n capacitors, C1, C2, on up through C sub n, and place them in parallel with a current source, I of t. Now since this is a parallel combination, they all share the same voltage difference, V of t. They do not, however, all share the same current. Capacitor C1 has current I1 of t, capacitor C2 has current I2 of t, and so on and so forth. Now, if we apply KCL at this upper node, the current going into the node, I of t, is the sum of all the individual currents. So it is I1 of t plus I2 of t plus all the other currents up to I sub n of t. Now we're going to hark back to our capacitor voltage current characteristics. The currents through capacitors are related through a differential equation to the voltages. So I1 of t is C1 times dV by dt. I2 of t is C2 times dV by dt on down to I sub n is C sub n dV by dt. If I sum these all up, OK, these terms are all in common. I can factor that term out. I end up with C1 plus C2 plus a bunch of other capacitances up to C sub n, all times dV by dt. This looks the same as some equivalent capacitance times dV by dt, where the equivalent capacitance is just the sum of the individual capacitances. I'm going to summarize this on the next slide. So as I mentioned previously, this parallel combination of capacitances can be represented as a single equivalent capacitance. So this circuit here is indistinguishable from this circuit under the circumstances where this equivalent capacitance is the sum of the individual capacitances. So CEQ is the sum of the individual capacitances, or summation from k equals 1 to n of C sub k. This is very comparable to the equation that we got for resistances placed in series. If, in the back of your mind, you want to think that capacitances in parallel combine in a similar way to resistances in series, that also is perfectly fine with me. Okay, let's take a look at an example of combining series and parallel capacitances. These two capacitances here are in parallel. They will sum directly. So if I combine these two capacitances into an equivalent capacitance, my overall circuit looks like this. 6 microfarad capacitor in series with another capacitance, which is 1 microfarad plus 2 microfarads. Remember, capacitors in parallel add directly. So this becomes a 3 microfarad capacitance. Now, this 6 microfarad capacitance and this 3 microfarad capacitance 
add the same way parallel resistances would. So CEQ is 1 over 1 over 6 microfarads plus 1 over 3 microfarads, which is the same as 6 microfarads times 3 microfarads over 6 microfarads plus 3 microfarads, which is going to be 18 over 9 microfarads or 2 microfarads, which is the equivalent capacitance of the overall network. This concludes lecture 15. So primarily in this lecture, we have introduced our first electrical energy storage element, capacitors. In the next lecture, we'll introduce our other electrical energy storage element, inductors. Now, a lot of the mathematics of inductors is very comparable to that associated with capacitors, so I'll be able to get through that fairly quickly. So towards the latter half of the next lecture, we'll actually start looking at some overall electrical circuits that contain capacitors and inductors and writing the governing equations for those types of circuits and solving them.